those meanings influence how we make decisions and then make, make decisions concerning our experiences in the world. Now, before an organization can learn, it has to have meaning structures about it. What do I mean by that? This guy called this me, argues that organization learning lies in what the gentleman here says, the ability to share. Share what, share what you know. So meaning lies in sharing of information. Uh, learning starts from sharing. So it's, he argues that in an organization, before we can learn, there should be accessible knowledge or there should be accessible meaning structures. That means that people should share what they know and the company should also allow what we know as a quality for opening it up for discussion. The problem is that there are certain rules and regulations that you can never have a question and you cannot work here. You cannot question them, you cannot challenge them. So it says that if you want to ask to learn, we will learn when we have more accessible mini structures. That means that mini structures or knowledge, accessible knowledge that we can influence, change, and then um, discuss. That means he who has his knowledge has to share as an individual. And then the managers have to allow the collective one to also be discussed. But this is difficult than as I'm saying, it's not as easy as it's said. Because individuals have to, we, have, we all have what we call private meaning structures, things that you don't share or you know that you want to keep because of competitive reasons. You are going for the same position with your other colleague in the office. You would like to go and say it first, because if you say it first, you will be more than you. So you end up putting certain things and you don't say it. There are some things that you also keep and you don't share because you don't want to be punished or be singled out of the organization. So you share it being lunch break, what was you are sitting at a chicken thing or all the other places on the run. But when you are in the office of violence, you never share that information. That's what we call private meaning. Private meaning is what individuals choose to keep and refuse to, refuse to share with the organization just because of many other related reasons. It can be for personal reasons, it can be for competitive reasons, it can be for, um, for protection. You might just want to know the information. Those are good like the information to use it against the person at the right time. So that's what private meaning is. So people keep a lot of private meaning. This is argues that if you want us to be able to share and learn, then you have to allow private meaning, open it up for discussion, share your private meaning, share what you know. If you don't share what you know, the organization doesn't benefit from learning. And that's the same argument you are making here. Then, there is also what we call collective meaning structures. What we know as an organization, like our rules, or it's just as collective knowledge. I'm just using meaning structures to explain. Now, our collective knowledge of many structures, if we don't open them up for discussion, we cannot be able to change them. We can only change what you don't know. So if you can want to change it, that means I have to open it up for discussion. But not all firms have that opportunity of doing that. Because it will never come up. That is why it's very good that in some offices they institute Monday morning meetings. What we view what happened last week. And try to look at where we fall short or where we need, where we did well and learn from it. However, if you don't <coughs> admit that you made a mistake, you know that sometimes you'll be punished. Because of that, people don't see admit even when they make mistakes. They don't say you cover it up. Because you don't feel face as you see it. And when you have an environment that there's so much punishment mechanisms, more rules and regulations to control behavior and punish people. You are going to have that environment full of stifled of knowledge. Nobody would like to talk. Everybody is in this is in cubicle, in private life, and I'm doing my job. And this is kind of job. I didn't say it. Who told you that I said it? <laughs> so you are hearing people who are in the same office, sharing the same printer. And because of the way the printer is positioned, this guy will never get up and go to another person's printer to go and print it. You rather go and print in a different office. Because you are afraid that if you go and go and say something, the information will be written in the wrong way. In the same way. So we can only learn what we choose to share the meaning structure. Now what we choose to make the meaning accessible. Organizational learning happens when meaning is accessible. We are willing to make it available for others to discuss and learn. So I will agree that if 
you don't share the information, you will not learn. Now, there's another question that I, 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 I will ask them. I will ask them. A related question to the first one. If an employee lens has organization lens, if an employee lens, I pay two thousand dollars take you to Cisco classes in the US and you come back. When you come and bring topics to everybody. Become a show as protest on what you do in Seattle. <laughs> if you were to learn, have, have we all learned? Have we all? Oh, no, have, no, okay, no, that's wrong. I just say, has organization learned? Has organization learned? I just said, has it learned? Now, whenever they ask that, can your organization do this? Supposed to say yes and call you. So that's the organization yes. Yes. Because every individual is a representative of the organization. So if I have learned something, I'm going to use it to the benefit of the organization. So in a way, the organization has learned something through me. I have a question here. How do you want to have bands and the guy is not around? Where are the organization going to guys? The man who has to do it has to So has the organization been No. No. Unless that meaning is shared. But if chances are, what shows that the guy who went for the Cisco training, he sat at a place throughout the entire world. <laughs> he would have not been. He said about the Nigerians that when you go for conferences, they spend their time shopping. So when they are coming back, you see the guy then joining their game, they are still having their conference bag, and he went for the conference. And the Nigerian, you see the Dubai bags. And everything, the rubber bags, yeah, there's no conference bag. <laughs> but when you get home, they want to see the case you got. And again, they want to see the knowledge you play. It's a very, very different, different approaches. Anyway, I'm asking a question then. Have the organization learned? No. Only the person shares the information. The guy can even do a seminar to share the information. Still, Nobody will show up at the seminar. Haven't you come and you're written um, your mission report or your phone report no and you put it and you forward it to go and get your claims? And it's only the film office that will find it out for you. Nobody will ever go and collect it and read that. What happened? Because you have to go to finance, you write your report and the finance will give you, okay, and the rest of the paper here, and extra expenses that you have. Then you collect it. And even that report, what you're in your hurry to get the money, just write one page or two. You just suddenly just send it to them. Finance to that doesn't actually read it. So far as I receive it, you'll find it. Then you can take your time and write a better report later. But I'm asking you a question. In that sense, we have actually not learned until we have shared the information. And we need to have structures in the organization that encourage sharing of information. Some organizations have it, others don't have it. And sometimes the structures are as simple as even just playing playing games, so the tear of tissues and then because it breaks why why do you think companies invest a lot in extracurricular activities outside the office? Because sometimes the, the MD in the different departments will never know it, but you know him is a good footballer. So by that then oh that you know come there, the guy who scored the goal in the other match. Then you know him from that one. So you actually when you are approaching, oh remember oh put your back with your old because of the fact that that social relationship opens you up for you to trust the person. And sometimes people are working in the they don't trust their fellow employees that they are working with. They treat them as employees, nothing else. So I will only talk to you because you are in the office. But even when you are in a car park and you are in public, you see what you are in the park, you are in front of me and it becomes a more, you know, as your fellow colleague, you are actually in the office. Don't you, like, you always feel like, even if they meet in the morning, they pound on each other and say, we don't even know each other. <coughs> Why? Because we all treat each other, we treat each other as just employees. 
And sometimes you are forced to do that because of the kind of context that you are in. The office is very large. It's, you know him by his face, you see him by his cubicle, and you always pass by him, his desk. But whether you know his name, or you know, sometimes you only know the first name, or the guy name you call in the office, slow boy. So you know that that's slow boy, slow boy, and that's how everybody goes there. Until we start sharing information, put in structures to share information, it means how very, very difficult for us to learn. And that's one of the objectives of why English sharing and knowledge management is important. Then we ask ourselves, then how do we share the information? How do we capture knowledge? How do we share it? So they think that information is embedded in most. So they are very, very keen on reports. Have you written your report? Have you written your film report? Have you written it? Have you found it? They are more about quantifying everything you are doing. Have you written it down? When you went to see a client, when you came back, have you written a, a write-up or a summary of what happened in the place? Because they believe information is more of a structural element. It exists there, they should be able to assess it. Others also think about information as more of a processual thing that even exists in the minds of people. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. So they believe in much more uh, in, in, in tension, uh, spending time with venturing, and you being assigned to a, um, uh, 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 another employee, work with him, visit all the departments, sit, spend two weeks here, three weeks here, four weeks here, two weeks here, so they can get an overview. Another organization will just sit you in one room and put the video inside, watch the video after that you know us. They start to work. I hope you understand what I'm trying to do. I just take time, a year, for you to move to different departments and experience and know the culture. I just also give you the book, sit by the video or read it and you can know the culture. By spending time, it's not just about interacting with them, but it's observation too. You get to know where which departments are more friendly, which departments can you give the information is useful, fresh, and they know that it's through this social interaction or interfaces of interaction that is where knowledge is created. There are certain things that you pick up by just going to sit in a coffee and just observe that you've been told. In many offices, I've seen this breaker wall where the printer is positioned for work. If you disclose to this person too much, it's a problem. Because people don't like working to another person's office, you pick much as they So even IT managers are forced to make sure they position a distance to each other. So there's no problem. Otherwise, someone can pick a document and just bang it. Maybe you have not experienced that. I, I, I see it. So especially if the printer is housed in one of these office, and maybe as a lady, you are having a confrontation with him, and you don't like. Printing always going to the office to print it. Sometimes I'm going to say, I'm printing too much. What are you doing? And you know sometimes we are printing our own books and all the side. So you don't want to be seen. So that's why some of those extra hours, not because they are working, it's because they won't spend time and do other things that they cannot do when other employees are there. So they spend some time in the office. And find it. It's true. Yes, please. I keep it. I said that they do the office. They can go my office and have supplies. So you you have two approaches. Whether you you want first that see information as a structural element, they spend more time recruiting and developing very young employees. 
fresh from the university, they put you in a program that you just can be read and you, you go for training programs like that is enough for them and they'll build you. So they invest more in fresh graduates. But firms that spend more time seeing information as more of what you know, depending on the function, spend more time looking for experts. Because they know that it's out of experts that they can get what they, they can learn from. So they invest more money in experts. And even in, in attracting the people, they will want to people who have more years of experience so they can bring what they know to the particular thing that they're working with. And even, and even in some uh, offices, it's more about the functional roles. Depending on the entry level, they will like an expert, and another entry level, they will like the robots. Suddenly, so somebody can do a use. I hope you understand that. Like, if you want to open more accounts, you don't bring experts into the office. You bring this eager first year that after uh, fresh graduates who are getting their first pay. I tell them that any, any client to bring in a commission of 10% to go to ASC, all the balls, and you bring some bank, what in the sign of banking, you are paying for products. Yes, not some bank, what in the sign, and the Nigerian banks are the ones who want, what in the sign and look for clients. Nobody likes that thing. Oh, you're not offering that money, nobody. They are in the power sector. So we don't do this. We can document to document presentation on structured documents and we can develop online expert methods so that people can share knowledge. And in terms of keeping it, we can store them in databases, document management systems. Some companies have got what we call document management systems. Everything is coming automatically and put it together. The management system and then start giving it automatically. Every document that comes there, every letter that comes to the office is kind of automatically and key in it. So that they can, and if it can surprise you, they tell you bring one letter. At that point, point, your letter never moves out. The scan one is the one that moves to all the offices. So they work on that document. And some also build, by, by building that um, document management system, they also index it or target with keywords so that people who matter or who are assigned to that particular role will only work on it. So somebody who scans something and put marketing as one of the keywords, marketing and maybe, maybe finance. So as soon as you put in the system, if you are in marketing and finance, you can be able to pull out anything that has some for you to be able to work Or others also fall into it. To, uh, the arrest of members. But it's not very efficient in some firms in Ghana. You take one letter and two weeks time you come back and the responsible manager has still not seen the letter. Haven't you seen that be happening to you before? You ask. You say it has not come to my desk. And even in some offices, you submit the letter and the letter gets lost in the same first law. <laughs> And sometimes maybe you didn't do a photocopy and kept a copy. Yeah. But some offices have become quite innovative. Every document you bring, they sign and give you a receipt. And they tell you who it's going to. Give me Right now, people cannot find out where, where they are. Whether they are exempted or not. You say, come to the office and you pull it up. I thought you would say that you even email it. I like I like what you said. When you select the and then the house, he will set in this information to Sometimes also I like also to submit information to not informal networks, to network um, training programs, people sitting down in meetings with cars or even sharing. Uh, in, uh, in to discuss how to share more information and knowledge. But companies that find a way of letting people share knowledge without even going to share knowledge have got the potential of gaining more from their employees. For example, we create an environment where employees come and get have fun, but they are also learning. Departmental competitions, like that. You put, um, we get there and say that and tell them that okay we want to achieve this. The first department with does that and we'll, two collaborations able to do it very well, we'll be given this and that. And you see how much 
effort employees will put in to just get their part of their work done. And somehow we'll share information with other employees that you need to talk to them because they want the work to be done at a faster rate. So we need to find a way of creating more interfaces of interaction in the firm so that the information can be disseminated faster. Some other firms also just build the knowledge repository, one place where all the information is. So if you want anything, any report from the past, you don't go to them and you ask, you ask them and tell you. Knowledge application. It is not always obvious that you be giving the knowledge or you gaining knowledge you be giving the authority to apply. If some of you do reports, you go and go to the field, do your mission report, come back, come with recommendations, and it lies down. They ask yourself that why did they even send me on this mission? Because you are not giving the authority to act on it. Maybe everybody is talking about how that's why they gave the opportunity to the mission. So that you keep quiet. You travel today, then you travel one. It's yes, okay, then you are also born. <laughs> so if you can come to complain, be to your <laughs> So the, the challenge here is, are we giving of the employee the authority to act on what they learn? That's a big gap. It's not always that they are given the opportunity. So they learn it and they don't have the opportunity to apply it. Now this is a value chain model for knowledge. <laughs> knowledge is acquired, distorted, and disseminated. And, you, and in your book, it gives you examples of how to share the knowledge, how to move through the different stages of the ancient knowledge and learn from it. What you also experience in the organization is that some organizations focus on the whole knowledge department. So they have someone who calls the chief knowledge officer. I don't know whether there's anybody that has a knowledge officer in this office. <laughs> Yes, sometimes no. Research actually looks into products development and then um, service development. And they even look at the centers of products and evaluate them. Those are the ones that will do the customer satisfaction and get information into the product. Technically, in some places, it's different. Knowledge might not necessarily be doing evaluation. What you could actually be doing is just making sure that every information that is being used in the firm in the is shared and mixed. It's valuable and shared. All I always go back and look at some of the information that is always going around in our institutions. The information is there, but nobody. But it's like UK, they say the law works until the law doesn't work until they get the family so they jump. That's why we say the UK laws work very, very well. Every time you think you can beat it, you can beat it, you beat it, you beat it. But then they get to all the laws suddenly seem to work. And it's quite sad. So I would say that it's very important that we are not knowledge is shared and applied. In other offices, people set up what we call communities of practice. There are people who inform informally or formally come together to be sharing knowledge. And they can come from different departments. The idea is that they have a given purpose for making sure that knowledge is and the experiences and then um, the place are shared. Now some of them are some of the social networking professional groups that you know, like Nurses, nurses group. It's not necessarily nurses association, but a group that we have. Even if they have all rich groups in it, we come from the same community. Or we all in Kaswan group. That's one group. That's one group. group. So you try to share knowledge and read this and you can exactly assignments. It's like how a young child can be out and you know that somebody has not showed up in the exams. And the lecturer may not know, but you who come from that class will be knowing that Pani is not here. So you don't want to call family and tell them to come. I've seen it happen several times. The students are the ones who see their own friends. Like, here is the exam. Sometimes the guy is actually asleep. Yeah. No, I was telling you that the after the evening, after the evening. I think the first is after the morning. Why are you talking about the same thing? It's all in the Considering the types of knowledge management systems, we have three types that usually uh, can be found. There is one for enterprise knowledge management system. That is working at the enterprise level, like the same thing as enterprise applications. Bringing information across all the different departments. <coughs> then we have got knowledge management system. Sometimes it's particular to like, for a particular function or role. For example, 
people do uh, frequently ask questions on maybe customer service or a particular product. So it's very specific. In um, in the in the U in, the, in Germany, Tata company owned a particular firm that they used to um, they used to repair uh, pipes and other things for a number of companies in Germany. And I was in the conference that the guy was one guy was just showing you how the knowledge web system works. He explained that what you have is a geographical location system that shows you where every particular area is. So if you have any problem, you can actually find the problem that you have and to tell you the names of the engineers who have had that problem before at their, at their particular, uh, where they are located. And if you are online, it shows yellow. So you can click on, you can go on the map and click on it and tell them your problem and they will answer you. Sometimes you can also read the person's long history or things that you are going to and some of the experiences they are getting there. They can learn from it. Now, the reason why they don't geographically position is if you are having a problem that you, after reading you cannot do it, you find a, the engineer who is closest to you and tell him to come to you where you are so that he can help you on size. So you see, the knowledge is there. You can either interact with the person online, you can read his own books that has just captured there, or you can call the person to uh, come to your site and then you can come and help you. So that's how some of these specialized systems work. It helps you to know, capture knowledge and share knowledge in a particular, particular profession, in a particular uh, scientific domain. And in fact, a normal institution, especially in the scientists, intelligent techniques, then beyond these two systems, there are intelligent techniques that we can use to discover knowledge from systems. And I think I'll just briefly talk about two of them. These are the types of systems. One point that you need to always know is that it's only eight, eight, most of the percentage, a larger percentage of the information that organization is not structured. Uh, it's, it's in a form that is very difficult for people to capture. So you know, it's better that you use other semi-structured uh, uh, semi structured mechanisms or procedures to be able to actually capture the information. So structures that are much more, or mechanisms that are much more interpersonal. Like email is one, but it's lower. Video interaction, you ask to talk to the person on time. You can be able to talk to the person and interact with the person. And then face to face is the most, is the richest. Oh, and you can actually observe the person, the person turning on eye, lights, you can look at the eyes, how much is making, and be able to know whether, how, whether the person is telling you the people. <coughs> anyway. So, what, let me go to, I want to show you something. This is what I want to discuss. The other systems are very basic. Now, there are two types of ways that I want to help you to discover knowledge from data. The first one is case based reasoning. Just as I explained for the Tata case, you may have a system in which there is a lot of different cases. So, what case based reasoning does is that they, you have a platform that has captured different cases of what people are going through. Maybe if it's in a hospital or it's in an engineer an engineer's forum or it's in a, um, like an IT forum. Sometimes you go to your site, you find out what people are going through. Some clients went through this and they write their stories there. Now what this system does is that it stores the, the problems that people go through and enables you to come there and then search through the issues of the room and then identify something that's closer to yours. It's just the same thing like if your screen goes blank, you can go to the and type blank screen. You can read so much information about what is happening. Can I there's something I think you want to know about your own access? You can, you can type a question there and some people come, if you're lucky, somebody can answer. Yeah. And with other companies, they build platforms for you to actually just come and ask a question. An example is um, um, Espresso's um, group. If you go to their website, their group on Facebook. Thank you. If you go into that and you have a problem, you can just type it out and you know, somebody will call you, you can leave your phone number, somebody will call you and then reach out to you and then help you to address your issues. But what is different here is a system like this can actually capture different cases and store them together. So a case to do with more nutrition will be one. A case to do with maybe hypertension will be one. A case to do so 
there are different cases and they are well tapped. What I mean by they are well, well, well keyworded. It means that every case has a keyword in it. So you type it, you search within that particular platform, you can put out the information. Easier for you to read. To read. And that, so you, the user comes to the platform, he describes the problem. The system searches the, um, the database and other similar cases. The system asks the user to add additional information if the case goes more narrow. The system finds the closest fit and then gives it to the particular person. And sometimes, what the, what the person is successful, it will ask you that you find it useful and it will get you ranking. A very simple one is the reviews that you read. Though you review when you are buying a product in places like Amazon or other websites, they ask you to review. So if you come and find a review useful, you can claim that I found a review useful. And it helps you to rank. I know maybe quite a number of languages, you don't spend time doing all this. You just read what others have said and go. You never leave your comments. You add to it. You subtract from it. And you just read and go Because you are, you know, one, the internet for you is this thing, it's not yours. Or you, you are not bothered about it. Mm -hmm. We are not used to doing that. Because we don't even like voicing out our own opinions about the shit. Like that we are complaining. The same way, you get opportunity to review the product and see that whether it is good or not. Keep pushing the book and the other on some website and read them. And even review their service, especially in restaurants. You go there and you order the food. And you sit down and you are waiting. And they tell you 15 minutes. And sometimes it's about 30, 30 minutes. In, in all some companies in the US, they say that, they tell you that if you don't send within 30 minutes, it's from us. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. So they try to tell you that they will serve you with the thing. You know, it's not that they are food. And people try to do that. When they try to do it, like, they will order one, then they will start trying to do some changes in it, so they mess up, mess up the order. And when you come, you know, you need to say, you order this, and I tell you, they you know, realize this is the thing, this is not you. But people do that. They, uh, they do find ways of way, make ways and means of reaching out of situations in scenarios like that. So case-based reasoning enables us to look at the cases that are containing a particular challenge or a particular problem and then assess it and make a choice of what is closest to the one that we are going to. I don't know whether anybody has used this system that enables you to do that. You have used that before. No, for us, we will say somebody will say consider forms to a very simple, simplest form of it. But these are systems that are built actually to document cases and then tag them very well. Yeah, for paper, paper, paper has it very well. Okay, go there, you see different cases. Yeah, you can see if you have an issue, yeah. you can even with a very well person. Virtual person, yeah. I mean, you can answer. Depending on what you like, the keywords and what you need to find. That, the, the other one of the, the other way of finding data and knowledge out of the world of data is what we call neural networks. By building patterns out of data. And this one is done through different ways. For example, if somebody has a credit card and he stole it, and somebody is using it, if you start using it, this is one of the ways that a person you can find a credit card is stolen. For example, if you own the credit card and you register it, you leave it as well. And we find that the credit card is being used in Tokyo. So we start looking at the age, income, purchase history, frequency of purchase, purchase size. If for the last maybe five years that you have actually um, been buying from us, you have never bought anything from Tokyo, it's likely that when you are traveling in, all our social as you are traveling to Tokyo, or you are traveling out, or they have never asked that. You should be giving international purchasing right. You know some cards, you have to call them and tell them that you want international um, um, usage on, on it so that whenever you move out of the country, it can work. In that case, if anybody is asking, you know, when you issue the command, it hits a server, and the server will ask that, is that the person authenticates it and allow the train to go through. So sometimes they will block it because of the fact that, or it will allow that purchase to go through after that, they will block it. Just because it is by putting many information together, I know that you are not the person. 
using it. There is, the chances that you are the one using it is very minimal. So what neural networks does is it creates patterns among data so that you can be able to identify a person. It's like how one of the screen uh, profiling. It creates patterns among data. We, we look at something like age, we pick something like the income level of the person, we look at purchase history, frequency of purchases. So, and then all of a sudden you, you want to buy a car or a credit card. And it's like what your credit limit is, let's say uh, $500. And you all of us, you want to buy a car to $2,000 from the car. The reason why we maybe think that it's an error or it's a, 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 a fraudulent transaction is the person that pays below the limit of the card. So you do that big purchase on it. And secondly, maybe the person is now located in a different country, which is not in your history and you've even traveled there before. Because since you bought the car for 10 years, you have been using the car in Kaswa, that area for you. So we have all the history to show you using Kaswa. And even sometimes, I've seen it in some cars, when you use them on the different websites, they know you use maybe Amazon to do which of your purchases. All of a sudden, they see you buying on eBay. They could actually block it because they don't see you having a pattern of lifestyle that will be buying from there. Especially if you're a high-end user. You look at the card, it's always at maybe Hilton Hotel, it's always at um, the person is always taking first class in planes. And how much you are spending, every transaction you are doing is in about $100. None of the same starts in 20, 40, 35, somewhere. It looks a little bit not realistic. <laughs> Oh, question. Yes. Can I ask you can in the game of try to do something like that? For example, if you travel to that country, you want to go to the game. Yeah, when you're not going to ask you that, is it you? Yeah, yeah. You want to bring some pictures of different people. Facebook. For you to identify. That is what it's actually doing, how the neural network works. Because it's used, most of the people who have tried to do this and help me to create more secure systems so that at the end of the day you can draw patterns out of the information and realize that you are not a person. And currently I know that in some banks they will ask you that instead of asking for the full password, what is the first letter of your password? What is the fifth letter of your password? Because if you have the password, you know which is the first, which is the fifth, which is the sixth letter. And I also complain that that thing is not very good because basically you write the password down and you count. Especially if your password is 13 letters, uh, uh, often numeric characters. You want to count and find out which one is the ninth, which is the eighth, which is the seventh. Then you can put it in. And by the time you finish, you're actually written down on the table of wherever you are. And I'm going to see it. So is it, is it efficient? I just say it's efficient. I just also complain about it. Even in the banks. And a friend was telling me that they have a problem with security because while they are processing information, most every screen has its own password. And some of the passwords they change every two weeks or something like that. So every time you have to have some small paper that you have written, the different password screen X, this screen, um, claim screen, this is the password. Then we move to customer profile screen, this is the password. And if you start keeping writing them down that way, you end up actually sharing the password to everybody. Mm -hmm. Because they can't keep it. And they also want to leave very simple password. Kofia Mark. Kofi Service Service. Most simple, simple password. And they also give you letters mixed with um, other characters, dollar sign, minus sign, and all numbers. And, and you can't keep it. When it's about seven letters, you actually keep it. <laughs> <laughs> so you can end up by choosing around the country. I want to build it together. Bring information together to find out whether we are having a valid purchase or not. And we apply it in many different ways in information security. So one thing that we have learned today now, if you are going to pick anything for exams, that's the first time I'm giving, first class I'm giving you to present the exam. Understand whether you need to know the district course to collect the knowledge. And when it does, and when it does not.
If you ask a parent, they might call it intuitive. If you ask a musician, they might call it inspiring. To a doctor, it's groundbreaking. To a CEO, it's powerful. To a teacher, it's the future. If you ask a child, she might call it magic. And if you asked us, we'd say it's just getting started. <laughs> 